Okay, so today we're going to do some forces and fields review. Uh, this is going to be based around a practice unit exam that I would have given out. Uh, here we go. So we're going to walk through a selection of questions that originally were on our practice unit exam. I posted this practice unit exam on Google Classroom as well as the answer key. Uh, just keep in mind the answer key that I posted on Google Classroom is not made by me. It was actually made by another teacher in our district. Uh, so the answers there might be just a little bit done like in a bit of a different way than I would do it. Uh, now, we're not going to do all the questions in that practice exam today. It would take way too much time. Uh, so there will be some others for you to try on your own. If you want to try them first, go for it. Another idea is to pause this video each time I change slides and then try the question yourself and then watch me go through it. So whatever floats your boat, unless you just want to watch me go through all these questions, up to you entirely. Now, remember, our Forces and Fields Unit exam is on Monday, April 6th. Uh, that'll be open for two days. Ideally, you'll do it on Monday, April 6th, but if you need to do it on Tuesday, April 7th, that is fine as well. Uh, it's going to cover electric forces and fields, magnetic forces and fields, and electromagnetic induction. We'll get a little bit of practice on all of those concepts with these questions that we do today. Anyway, here we go. So the first question uh, that we're going to go over from that practice unit exam is numerical response to. It says two conducting spheres have identical surface areas, blah, 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 blah. You can read all of it. Anyway, Bottom line is, if we're going to go over a question here, the whole idea is we're looking for this electric force, okay? So the electric force, of course, has a bunch of different formulas for it. But since it's an electric force between two different charged objects, we're going to use the formula that says Fe equals kq1, q2 over r squared. K was a constant. It was 8.99 times 10 to the 9, and that constant is on your formula sheet. I do know before uh, the class cancellations, a lot of you guys program that in your calculator itself. Uh, whatever floats your boat, though. The one thing we need to see is the fact that Q1 and Q2, while sort of given to us in this question, are going to be different than what the question actually gave us. Notice sphere A has a charge of 6.0 PC. Now, PC, just by the way, usually we're, we're dealing with a mu, like it was mu C. That would have been a micrometer or micro coulombs, I should say. Uh, but PC is actually pico coulombs, okay? Pico is on your formula sheet. If you look on your formula sheet on, I think it's the second page, uh, P is pico, pico is 10 to the negative 12, okay? So that's what that P right there stands for. That was an awful arrow. There you go, that's a better idea. So the P right there stands for times 10 to the negative 12. We don't see that one very often, but just keep in mind, all of those uh, metric units are on uh, your formula sheet. Uh, anyway, so long story short, this one, a positive 6.0 picocoulombs, is being touched to this negative 3.5 picocoulombs. Now, when two different things with a charge touch each other, they are actually going to uh, basically get the average of their two charges. So here's how it's going to work. We're going to have 6.0 picocoulombs that's touching a uh, negative 3.5 picocoulomb sphere. And then they're going to be removed from one another, so you'll divide this by two, and that's going to tell you what the charge of each one is going to be. Uh, 6.0 plus negative 3.5 gives us 2.5 picocoulombs. Divide that in half gives us 1.25 picocoulombs. That right there is the charge of each of these spheres, so they're both going to have a positive 1.25 picocoulomb charge. In other words, these two spheres are going to repel from one another, because two things that have like charges are going to repel. Long story short, though, let's throw this into our Fe formula. Fe equals K, which is 8.99 times 10 to the 9. Q1 is 1.25 picocoulombs, which is times 10 to the negative 12. And then Q2 is the same thing, 1.25 times 10 to the negative 12. To save a little space here, if you wanted, instead of writing this twice, you could have just said 1.25 times 10 to the negative 12, end of the bracket, and then go squared, because there's two of the same thing. But whatever, I just wrote out the whole thing anyway. Uh, anyway, this is all going to be divided by R. R was actually given to us in the question. It's 1.8 centimeters, but just turn that into meters. So it's going to be 0 0.018. Uh, again, that's in meters. And I apologize for this being a little off. There we go. Good. Uh, throw that in your graphing calculator or any calculator, really. It doesn't have to be a graphing calculator. Anyway, Fe is going to equal uh, 4.3 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, newtons. Now, this question is one of those weird numerical response questions where it wants you to list the value of each uh, uh, digit that shows up in the question. So notice the answer is supposed to be A point B times 10 to the negative CD newtons. Well, A would be 4, B would be 3, 
and C and D are both one. So we can just write that as four, three, one, one. And that's how we're gonna record our answer on that one. Next one, multiple choice three. This one's a really dumb question, which you might be wondering why did I throw it in here then? Well, it's so dumb that if I had left it to you guys to do on your own, I know for a fact that I'd get a million questions on this. Uh, the diagram below shows the field generated near two locations, L and R. What is the polarity of each location? Uh, without any other context, like just looking at this alone, this could be a magnetic field, but it could also be uh, an electric field. They behave in very similar ways. Uh, so really, on its own, this question is kind of dumb, but then you look at the answers, and it says charge L and charge R. Well, the only things that have charges are electric uh, fields, of course. Magnetic have uh, magnetic poles, right? So immediately, because we know this is electric and not magnetic, we can cross out A and B because they talk about north and south. Like already, you can hopefully see how dumb this question is. Uh, but then, uh, again, we're trying to figure out which one uh, is positive and which one's negative. So is L positive or is R positive? Which one's which? Well, remember, in terms of electric forces, the arrows point away from the positive charge. So these arrows are pointing away from R. So that tells us that R needs to be the one that's positive. So the answer here, here is D. That is an absolutely ridiculous question, but whatever, I went over it anyway. Moving on. Multiple choice five. Uh, two oppositely charged plates have an electric potential difference of that many volts across them, blah, 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 blah. All right, there's an alpha particle going on here. That's gonna be really important to note. Uh, there's a hole in the negative charge plate. Yeah, okay. So notice I'm just skimming through this question. You can read it on your own time if you wish. I'm just trying to get through this just so you can get the information down. Uh, we're looking for the initial speed of the alpha particle. Uh, another thing we, we see here is it comes to rest just before it reaches that positively charged plate. Well, an alpha particle, in case you've forgotten, uh, does have a positive charge, okay? So the fact that this alpha particle is heading towards a positive plate means that this positive plate this entire time is gonna be trying to repel this positively charged alpha particle. And likewise, these negative plates are gonna be trying to attract it. So in other words, as this goes towards this positive plate, it's gonna start really slowing down. Like it's not gonna go nearly as fast and eventually it's gonna stop and then it's gonna to wanna to head straight back down towards these negative plates. We're just looking at where it comes to rest just before it hits that positive plate. Uh, since we're looking for an initial speed, this is actually gonna be one of those questions where the best way to go about it is looking at it from an energy perspective. When it enters this region, it really, like right here, only has kinetic energy, EK. It just has its kinetic energy moving forward. Uh, but once it reaches here and stops, it only has EP, potential energy, or more specifically, electric potential energy, because it, uh, of course, is generated by this electric field. Uh, now that energy doesn't just disappear, that energy gets transferred from being kinetic to being potential, okay? So if we are looking for our initial speed, it would be nice to find our initial kinetic energy, but our initial kinetic energy is gonna be the same thing as this final uh, potential energy. Well, to find that, if you look in your formula sheet, there's a formula that says delta V, so your change in voltage, equals delta E over Q. Now, your delta E is your change in energy. So this energy is changing from kinetic to potential. We know Q because Q is just the charge of an alpha particle, which is actually on your formula sheet as being uh, uh, 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19. Well, actually, the more I look at it, it's not on your formula sheet, but here's how you find it. Sorry about that. Here's how you find it. On your formula sheet, what it does tell you for the charge of an alpha particle is that it's positive 2E, but we know that one electron, E, is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. So just times that by two, and that does give us 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19. Sorry about that. Anyway, so Q, long story short, is this 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19. Uh, as for the voltage, the question told us the voltage directly. It's 1.2 times 10 to the two volts between these two plates. And this uh, alpha particle is traveling through that entire voltage, so we can use that entire voltage. Long story short here, let's actually use that whole voltage so we know it's uh, 1.2 times 10 to the two. That's kind of a dumb way of just saying 120. So let's write 120. 120 volts equals delta E over your Q, which is 3.20 times 10 to the negative 19. Multiply that over. You're actually going to get your delta E is equal, got it right here, hold on, is equal to 3.84 times 10 to the negative 17 
joules. Now, remember what I said earlier. This change in energy is your kinetic energy changing to potential energy. Since all of your kinetic energy is going away, then this number here, your change in energy, can actually represent your initial kinetic energy, EKI. All right? Since that's your initial kinetic energy, let's just use our kinetic energy formula to find our initial velocity. So we'll say that this 3.80, sorry, 3.84 times 10 to the negative 17 equals one half mv squared. Well, m of an alpha particle, that is on your formula sheet. Uh, it says it is 6.65 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, uh, and then times that by v squared. To get V all by itself, let's just times by two on both sides, then divide by this 6.65 times 10 to the negative 27, and then square root it. Long story short, you're gonna find that V is equal to 107,466 meters per second, or in other words, with proper sig digs, V equals 1.1 times 10 to the five meters per second. And that is one of our answers listed. So the answer here is A. Moving on to the next one. Uh, a proton is moved three centimeters in the electric field between parallel plates. Diagrams not to scale. How much work was done on the proton? Well, protons, of course, being a positive charge, work's going to be done if you're going to move it against the way it wants to move. Well, a proton wants to move towards a negative plate. And if you look carefully at this battery, we can see that this is the negative side and this is the positive side. So the fact that we're moving this proton towards our positive plate indicates that we do have to do some work to get there. Now work, of course, is a change in energy. Those are the exact same things. So that is what we're looking for here. And the only formula we have with forces and fields that deals with a change in energy is the one that says your change in voltage is equal to your change in energy over Q. Well, the nice thing about this formula is we know Q. It's because we're dealing with a proton. So Q is just 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. And then you might think you know your voltage because it says on the battery here, 25 volts. But unfortunately, we don't know this voltage because we're not passing through that entire voltage. A voltage is a potential difference. A potential difference, of course, goes from one plate to the other. This is only going part way through. So here's how I would go about doing it. We know our voltage and we know the distance between these two plates. We can use that information to find our electric uh, field strength. Uh, our electric field strength, of course, is E with the arrow on top, which equals your change in voltage over your change in distance. Because this is a situation with parallel plates, plates that are completely parallel to one another, this entire region in between the two plates will have the same electric field strength no matter where you are. So if we say the electric field strength equals the voltage we know, which is 25, over the distance between the two plates, which is 4.5 centimeters, or in other words, 0 0.045 meters, this will give us our electric field strength anywhere in between these two plates. So E with the arrow, the electric field strength equals 555.5 repeating, and I guess the units on that technically would be volts per meter. Now, the reason that this is useful is you can now reapply this same number into the same formula with a different distance to find the voltage between that distance. In other words, we can say 555.5 repeating equals our new voltage just in this region here, divided by three centimeters, so 0 0.03. Uh, anyway, so to find this new voltage, just times by that 0 0.03, you get your voltage, your delta V, equal to 16.6 repeating. Now this is the voltage that that proton actually passes through. So this is the voltage that we're gonna to wanna to use all the way up in this formula here to find your work, okay? So we've got 16.6 repeating equals delta E, which is your work, of course, divided by your charge. And the charge, of course, is the charge of the proton, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. Multiply that over and you're going to get delta E equals 2.7 times 10 to the negative 18, and work, of course, is measured in joules. And that happens to be one of our answers here, so the answer is uh, B. Moving on to multiple choice seven. This one, hopefully, will go pretty quick. It's a, a, just a, an application of one of our, our hand rules, really. Uh, a magnet's passed through an aluminum ring as shown. What is the direction of the induced current, induced current, 
at the point P, which is right here on the front of the ring, as the North Pole approaches the ring on the right side, and as the South Pole leaves the ring on the left side. So in other words, if we took a magnet, a bar magnet, and we just put it through this aluminum ring, what's gonna happen to the induced current at point P on the front of this ring? Well, what I want you to remember is when you bring a magnet into a circular conductor, like an aluminum ring, usually we dealt with copper wire, but an aluminum ring would work as well. Uh, basically what happens to the aluminum ring is it creates its own magnetic field within it. It's called an electromagnetic induction um, that wants to oppose whatever is about to happen to it. So if you're gonna, at first, like step one, number one here, if you're gonna first bring a north end of a magnet in, what this ring is gonna do is it's gonna go, no, I don't want a north magnet in here. So it generates its own uh, magnetic field by putting a north end here and a south end here, which is gonna repel this magnet from coming in because a north and a north are gonna repel each other. Now, from your hand rules, I believe it was our first or second left hand rule. I can't remember precisely each one, but it doesn't really matter. It's the one where you have your thumb pointing one way. Your thumb is pointing in the way, of course, of your magnetic field. So your magnetic field's pointing this way. So point your thumb with your left hand to the right, and then your curled fingers represent the way that your current is going to move. So if you point your thumb to the right here, you're actually going to notice that your current goes up this way, right? So at point P, as the north end of the magnet comes in, you're going to have an upwards induced electron flow. So automatically we can say that B and D are not correct. The answer has to either be, <clears throat> excuse me, A or C. Uh, moving on to the next part of the question, so I'll just erase all this. For part number two, the south end of the magnet is leaving this uh, aluminum ring, right? And just like before, uh, when a magnet's trying to move through here, they want to actually oppose whatever motion is going to happen. So as soon as this magnet's trying to leave the ring, the ring all of a sudden goes, no, I don't want the magnet to leave. So what the ring does to compensate and try to keep that magnet in there is it puts a north end here and a south end here because it wants to keep this magnet back in here. It wants to oppose the motion of that magnet. So now you're gonna point your thumb to the left. So, and again, using your left hand roll, point your thumb to the left and watch how your fingers curl. Your fingers are gonna curl actually over and above this and then down. So in other words, when this uh, south pole is leaving the ring, the current is going down. So the answer here has to be C. It's really important to understand that this was electromagnetic induction, right? And electromagnetic induction works by opposing the motion of the magnet that's going to be generating the induced current. Anyway, one more question here. It's written response number two. Uh, an alpha particle enters a perpendicular magnetic and electric field, blah, 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 blah. Okay, the whole idea here, I'll just skip through it, uh, is that this alpha particle is going to pass through undeflected, which basically means all of your forces are going to be balanced. Since it's a magnetic and an electric field, we can therefore immediately say your electric force is going to equal your magnetic force. Now, the other thing that this question wants is it wants us to figure out the potential difference across these plates. So the voltage between these two plates, because remember potential difference is just a fancy way of saying voltage. Uh, and it also wants to, us to find out which plate, either A or B, must be positive, okay? Well, first of all, these dots in this diagram are actually representing your uh, magnetic field. And a dot, I always said, think of it like the tip of an arrowhead. That dot is saying that it's coming out of the page, right? So your magnetic field is coming out of your page. Your alpha particle is moving up. Now, an alpha particle has a positive charge to it, okay? So when you're dealing with a positive charge and you're using your hand rules, you actually have to use your right hand instead not your left hand, because your left hand is used for negative particles. So with our third right hand rule, that's the one where we have our fingers pointed straight and our thumb pointed perpendicular to it, and our palm, the bottom of our palm, actually re represented uh, the deflecting force. Well, first of all, take your fingers, like your index finger, your middle finger, all of that, take your fingers and point them towards you with your right hand, and then make sure your thumb is pointed straight up. What you're gonna notice is your palm is pushing towards plate B. So your palm pushing towards plate B tells us that your magnetic force must be going to the right. If we're gonna keep this balanced, 
as we said before, where Fe equals Fm, and this thing's gonna be undeflected, that means we also have to have an electric force pushing it to the left. Now, the only thing that's gonna move a positive particle to the left electrically would be if this plate is actually negative, because a positive particle is gonna be attracted electrically to uh, a negative plate, which would tell us, therefore, that B must be the positive plate. So that actually answers one of our questions in here, right here. It says, which plate must be positively charged? We can say plate B must be positive. Okay, so that already answered half the question here, or at least so it looks. We haven't even done any calculations yet. For calculations, we're gonna have to just deal with this formula, Fe equals Fm. You might as well write out what those formulas actually are in terms of their variables. Fe has a couple different formulas, but the one that's gonna work here is E with the arrow, the electric field strength times Q, equals Fm, which is Q V perpendicular B with the arrow. And B with the arrow, of course, is your magnetic field strength. Uh, notice that there's a Q on both sides of this equation. It doesn't really matter because uh, we actually know what Q is here. It's the Q of an alpha particle. But since Q is on both sides of these equations, I'm just going to cross them out because it saves us a little bit of work. That means the electric field strength equals V perpendicular uh, times uh, the magnetic field strength. Now, uh, we know what our velocity is. It's given to us in the question. Here it was right up here. Uh, and we know what B with the arrow, or in other words, the magnetic field strength is. It's given to us right here. Uh, that's going to help us find E with the arrow. And if you're wondering, where on earth are we going with this? Well, E with the arrow, the electric field strength, can actually be used to find your voltage, right? And that's what we're ultimately trying to look for. We're looking for the voltage. So let's get at this. So it's going to be E with the arrow equals V, which is uh, 3.4 times 10 to the 5, times by B, which is your magnetic field strength, uh, 7.8 times 10 to the negative four. Uh, multiply those together, so you're gonna get E with the arrow equals uh, 265.2 volts per meter. Now, we just need to take this number and throw it into a formula that's gonna allow us to find volts. And the formula on your formula sheet that's gonna let you do that is gonna be E with the arrow equals delta V over delta D. So we're looking for our voltage, we have our electric field strength, we are uh, also given our distance, delta D, it's four centimeters. Uh, so just throw those numbers in and find your V. Uh, 265.2 equals delta V over 0 0.04 times that 0 0.04 over, and you're going to get delta V equals, rounded to two sig digs, 11 volts. Whew. All right, so I think we're done. Yes, we are. So for practice, I want you to complete all remaining practice problems in your Forces and Fields unit booklet. Uh, try any problems I didn't go over in the practice exam. It's posted on Google Classroom. Uh, the answer key is also posted on Google Classroom, but just remember, I didn't make that key. Another teacher in our district did, so their, their methods might be a little different than mine. Anyway, if you need any help, send me an email, send me a reminder. Best of luck, guys.